Uh oh. <laughs> Why is that happening? See, it's always something, isn't it? Now I'm just getting this spinning wheel of death. All right. Mm -hmm. How many tech people does it take to turn on the video? I know it worked perfectly yeah. last time. Of course, this time, no, no dice. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's try pausing that. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to our webinar. You'll get to see our awesome video later. Um, maybe, or maybe not. I'm Shenoa Farnsworth. I'm the managing partner at Blue Startups. And today we're going to be talking about the metaverse, what it is, what it isn't, what it will be. Um, and what I guess what it has been. All right, so we have an awesome panel lined up here today. Um, I'm going to tell you real quick about Blue Startups. Um, if you're new to our community, Blue Startups is a venture accelerator located here in Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, yes, this backdrop, while it's fake, it's pretty much really where we live. Um, we have been in business here in Hawaii for nine years. We have invested in 99 companies. We invest in scalable technology companies. Um, we look for uh, three sectors, so software, including gaming, um, sustainability, and the travel and tourism sector. Uh, we look for three types of founders, female founders, those with East and West qualities, so cross-border founders, and of course, Hawaii-based founders. Those are uh, some of the things we're looking for. We are currently recruiting for cohort 14, for Blue Startups. So if you are interested in spending some time in beautiful Hawaii and learning from our amazing mentors, we have 170 mentors in our network uh, with lots of different expertise. And we have, um, like I said, 99 companies in our portfolio now. We invest up to $100,000 into each company. Our applications are currently open at bluestartups.com. All right, so without further ado, um, I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. I'll start with Annie. Go ahead, Annie. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I am Annie. I am currently um, the host of the Hello Metaverse podcast. I was really interested in actually demythifying what the metaverse means, what it means to build it. And that's really been the conversations that I've had is the cultural and societal implications of what we're doing and the next wave of the internet. Um, I also work at Roblox as a product lead right now and working on figuring out what are new kinds of uh, experiences in multiple verticals that is going to help shape how people participate in the metaverse. Um, so that's been really fun stuff, too. Well, so welcome, Annie. Um, all right, Devin, go ahead, introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Devin Arig. I am a mentor at Blue Startups. I'm originally from Hawaii. and in relation to the metaverse. I grew up with one foot in Hollywood and with the other foot in the video game VR development business pretty much throughout my entire career. Uh, I am with a AAA video game development studio called The Rogue Initiative. We also have a sister company doing virtual production using metaverse and video game technologies to do film and TV production called the Area of Effect. And I'm really excited to share our perspective on uh, what it actually takes to build and the type of skill sets it needs to build a metaverse that everyone can enjoy. Awesome. Thanks, Devin. All right. Next, Pat with Vantaleaks. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Pat Cronin. I'm the CEO of Vantaleaks. Uh, we are a, a company that's basically putting esports coaches into schools. We train them through a leadership development program that we've created and allow them to help develop you know, uh, kids in middle school and high school as well. Um, so it's kind of an esports program, little league of esports, if you want to call it that. Um, I've been interested in the metaverse for a long time, big, uh, VR guy and uh, use some of the technologies that we'll probably talk about today. And, you know, our, 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 uh, origin is really focused around safety for the kids. And I think a, an important topic when we discuss the metaverse, um, is the safety component and making sure that there is a safe place in the metaverse for, for gamers and for, for people, uh, young people that are, are, are involved there. So. Really honored and happy to be here um, and you know, looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. And Pat forgot to mention, he's a Blue Startups alumni. That's right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just came out of uh, Blue Startups back in the fall. We spent about three months in uh, the lovely Honolulu. Every time I tell people that, different investors and and really family or whoever it is, they're just like, oh, that must have been a really tough, <laughs> must have been a really tough three months out there in the accelerator. So. 
but I can say it's, it's, it was a great experience uh, as a cohort company, uh, starting out and launching our product, launching our business. And uh, the, the list of mentors was incredibly helpful. Um, Shanoa is uh, one of the best people we, we could ask for in terms of a, you know, a advisor and investor and, and, uh, and a friend. So really pleased to have been part of it. Awesome. Okay, I see Patrick Lee is listening. Hi, Patrick Lee. Um, good friend of, of Blue Startups as well. All right, Ellen, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ellen, and I'm the Economic Development Specialist at the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. It's a mouthful, HTDC in short. Um, our mission is to tech enable Hawaii, and that's why, you know, we provide funding to Blue Startups, you know, um, Hawaii's leading accelerator to help build startups right out here in Hawaii. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't work a lot in with the metaverse specifically, but I do manage a program within HTDC called the Digital Currency Innovation Lab. And the purpose of that is to, you know, create a regulatory framework uh, for, you know, crypto based businesses here in Hawaii. Um, and we also explore a lot of economic development opportunities around crypto that we can bring to Hawaii's businesses. So that's me and I'm happy to be here today. Awesome. Thanks, Ellen. All right. So we're going to start, hopefully, uh, with some definitions. So everybody I've talked to has a different definition of the metaverse, and that's kind of what makes it fun, right? It's a little bit like uh, Internet 1.0. What is it? Um, I was telling the panel earlier, my only frame of reference is Ready Player One. That's, the, that's what I think about every time that I think about the metaverse. I hope it doesn't end up uh, that dystopian. It's not, a, not the preferred future. Um, but uh, I'd love to hear from our panel what they think. How are we defining metaverse? Annie, let's start with you as a resident expert here. <laughs> Well, this is kind of the billion, if not the trillion dollar question. Um, and usually when I get asked, what is the metaverse? I wanna take a step back and really try to think about why, why are we talking about this, right? Like why is this kind of a looming question for a lot of people? And I think really, instead of saying, hey, this is VR or this is exactly how it's gonna look like in Ready Player One, um, it's more about a confluence of a bunch of different trends, right? So the same way I grew up as a millennial in kind of the mobile internet and the social media age, um, it felt like there was a bunch of needs of millennials in that generation that was kind of untapped and was not really matched to what where technology was at that point. And so, you know, we see, we see the app ecosystem, we saw social media completely explode and define the last era of the internet. For me, the metaverse is just about defining the next era of the internet and what's going to be suitable for our lifestyles or the next upcoming generations. And so some of the things that I think are really important to call out is, you know, um, most things or most interactions are going to take place on the in the virtual world, whether it's education, whether it's entertainment, whether it's social, whether it's making money and making a livelihood. And so the metaverse is about figuring out what are really the, the ways in which that's going to happen in a, in a virtually digitally native way. Um, and then the second is also about like solving all the issues that we're not super happy with in the current version of Web 2, right? Um, there's a lot of complaints about the walled gardens of data and feeling like um, a lot of people's data were abused and, and, and people didn't have control over that. That's why the blockchain is such an important part of the conversation. I think a lot around you know, um, physical skeuomorphisms, right? Like right now on social media, you're just taking a photo of yourself, right? And that's not really a representation of who you are. And so is there a way to be more realistically you or more realistically showcase how you want to come off to people in a more multi-dimensional way? Um, so yeah, for me, I think the metaverse is more about not exactly what it's going to be and predicting it, but understanding what are the issues and what are the social trends that we want to match to so that it fits to people's needs. Awesome. Thank you, Annie. So Devin, my question for you is, does that mean in this definition of the metaverse, do we have to wear those goofy headsets or not? You're, so, you, 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 you've you been in VR for a long time. So yeah, what I, I, I think, I, I think, you know, I, I certainly understand where Annie's coming from with that definition. And I think it is a, a point of, a large scale point of debate actually in different developer communities, as well as as far as trying to understand what a framework can come to define, not so much what is a metaverse, 
and I, and I say a metaverse very specifically instead of the metaverse because it's we're really talking about this di distinction between what is the next generation of the of the internet when people talk about a buzzword called web3 well, what does that actually mean mm -hmm. and you know a metaverse can connect to web3 it also can connect to something that's been around quite a long time and you know vr is sort of one medium one way of interacting with a space that defines a place enabled by the internet where people can gather together to communicate and solve problems but we've been long before vr that's been happening particularly in the game world i mean people second life in fact one of the founders of second life even lives in hawaii mm -hmm. he's a doctor now who's been there for, for for a long time and 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 so so there, there have been iterations of this that built originally on gaming technology because it was gaming technology on which all the graphics of this reside. It was gaming technology that helped drive the internet forward in different ways of communication at its earliest phases. And so there's there's the element of, of this, this medium, this room, this digital space in which we interact and how that has been iterating and evolving together with the element of, well, what will the internet become in its next generation? And what are some of these challenges, as Annie alluded to, that Web2 has presented itself centralization sort of pillars of ownership around this walled gardens as somebody just mentioned in the chat these 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 type of issues i think web3 takes a piece of it whether or not all metaverses overlap with that is 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 i think is i think a bigger question and it's one of the areas where you see when people you know issues around like blockchain and whether that works in the gaming world or not and how that interacts you see these interesting discussions and criticisms pop up all everywhere I think the general direction is coming that. So I, I, I think it's VR is a metaverse. Applications within VR is a metaverse. VR is an access point into a metaverse. Mm -hmm. I think there's multiple metaverses that will that will enable different communities to work and engage with each other on different things. And I think that's an important distinction because when you just throw around the terms a little too loosely, it becomes something that is that's a little bit slippery to grasp. Yeah, and just a follow up to that, Devin. I mean, this idea of kind of interoperability of the metaverses, if you will, like how far away is that? How how far away is it that I'm going to be able to wear my my digital basketball shoes, which I know Patrick Lee is investing in one of those companies, into every metaverse that there is? Without so I'm I'm trying to think of uh, of, of the layers of that interoperability in a large part it depends on the software in which you're you're building these, right? So if I create a 3D model of something and I want to move that between one software and another, there's a lot of technical requirements to make that appear in one environment the same way it does. There's two layers of questions. How, how far are we from technically creating bridges that let that automatically happen? We, we, we have that, that's there. Do people want to implement it in their project is a question. Is there a reason for them to? But there's a lot of solutions out there that let people, in the film world, we've started doing this already. We can. Uh, we, we can put a director, a producer, and a cinematographer in a virtual world together and have an artist join into them from five different locations and be manipulating stuff. And we do this all the time now. So it's a it's it's something we can do. The bigger question is, well, well, why? If I'm playing a Elven, you know, Elven Rings, like why would I want to jump into StarCraft, right? Like, like how do those two things connect? And I think I think that's at the phase now where the technology is at a point where we can do these things. And we're slowly fleshing out why certain things connect with each other. Is it community driven or story driven? Is it, you know, another, is it a financial thing connecting to blockchain or to iterations on NFT markets where we see, or is it something around sort of the backgrounds of people? So it's, it's a very interesting question you put out there. And I don't think we actually have 100% the answer yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as Annie was talking about bringing your, your whole self, I was, you know, I'm thinking about avatars, of course, that's what. It makes me think of the avatar and my avatar is going to be dressed a certain way and I want my avatar to look and you know present itself in the same way in multiple of these of these metaverses so I'm, I'm sure smart people are figuring that out right now but one, one of one of my favorite discussions in the nft world these days is people arguing about w whether or not these can be valuable in games I'm like, well people have been buying skins and games for already. 10 years i go that's <laughs> we already know that's valuable the question is why do i want one skin from one game to go to another game what's the point of that and how does that connect with each other so it's yeah. it's all these layers fit together like that and make it so interesting it was a fashion, Devin, fashion. Yeah. Um, right. oh, obviously, obviously my area of expertise. Yeah, yeah. Pat, Pat what's, your, what's your definition of the metaverse? Yeah, uh, I, I think there's a, a critical component too. We, we throw a lot of words out there 
uh, Web3, Web2, Metaverse, and a lot of these can sound interchangeable. And so I think just for the audience's sake, you know, when we talk about Web1, you have a classic internet where you have browsers, web pages, et cetera. Web2 oh. is really where you have a user-generated internet. Right? This is apps that came out in 2005, 2010 timeframe. Um, and this Web3 can typically get confused with the metaverse, right? Where you have Web3, which is more of, of a decentralized internet. You've got uh, DAOs and you've got, uh, you know, NFTs that are supporting this in the blockchain as opposed to the metaverse, which, you know, I, I, I see as more of an immersive experience. It's not necessarily a technology. It's not necessarily the Web3, but it's an immersive experience. It's a, a unique universe that you can enter and be fully immersed and fully replicate, you know, a, 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 a the the reality that you're in right now is a typical society. And so there's an economic layer to that. There's a rule-based layer um, with safety involved, um, and then you have this very immersive experience. Which, you know, if you talk to a World of World of Warcraft player, um, you know, they'll tell you that that's that's part of the metaverse. You talk to a RuneScape. You know, like I, I remember in uh, middle school, I used to play RuneScape and you know, we'd be alt tabbing between what we were supposed to do in the computer lab and in the game, you know, when the teacher's coming by. Um, but there were people had at 10 years old, they had a RuneScape girlfriend, you know, they were trading for, uh, you know, gear and materials in the game. I, I remember one of my, um, one of my friends from West Point uh, was a big WoW player. And when he got in the army, he wasn't able to play as much anymore. And so he sold his account for about $15,000 uh, to just swap the you know, the, the passwords on, an, on a marketplace. And so the, this concept of a metaverse has existed for a long time. It's really just the technologies that are changing, that are um, kind of enabling more conversations and changing people's perception of what this looks like to more of a snow crash type or a, a ready player one type um, environment, which is all virtual, which I think is, you- is part of it. You really bring up such a good point. It, it brings to mind that Van Gogh experience that's been traveling around the world right mm-hmm. now, if everybody's yeah. seen that, right? And yeah. if, uh, and I'll give you an example. I think one of the next iterations of metaverses is going to be the online to offline. How are we connecting the experience in an immersive online enabled metaverse, quote unquote, experience to something that is also in the real world? And how are we interacting between that? I think that's a huge layer that is now starting to be explored. If we took the Van Gogh exhibit, the digital mapping of that exhibit that got outputted to projectors that you then go walk through and buy a ticket for, well, that would call an immersive art experience and that's that. But if I then translated that same digital map, exactly the same, nothing nothing different, and put that into a virtual room with Van Gogh projections on the wall and invited people to come in and talk about Van Gogh or other artists virtually, either through a desktop or a VR headset, now all of a sudden I'm calling it my art metaverse, mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. right? At, at which point does the experience sort of shift yeah in that line i think we're kind of defining that that variable right now well i think it's interesting too pat what you're talking about is that anytime you talk to a gamer right they're like we've been doing this we've been doing this for a long time like what are you guys talking about yeah we sell virtual goods big deal you know um so so ellen i want to get to you you know your definition and also again you've been you've been working in crypto a lot so Tell us how these things connect. You know, where is that connection point between this, this, these concepts of metaverse and crypto and blockchain and NFTs and all of the other, all the other hype, hype yeah. words. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think you know, you know, I thought about the question, you know, when you sent it over to us, like, what, what is the metaverse? And I think it's a term that you know I've been grappling with on my own, you know, and looking all the different definitions out there. Uh, but you know, I kind of want to second what Patrick said. I think the, the word for for me is actually immersive because you know being born and raised in Asia we actually had a lot of social communities already you know like decades ago where we had avatars and we were buying you know different skins and you know like basically dressing up our avatars in those social communities so I don't for me I don't think that's that's what the metaverse is but you know how do we make it more lifelike and more immersive um, you know going forward with this you know new emerging technologies in VR and AR uh, but I think what's so interesting for me is you know I think to the to your other question about you know when when is this going to come I think you you posed that question over to Devin earlier and I think it really requires like a fundamental shift in consumer behavior because I you know I what I've been seeing through my work with the digital currency innovation lab is there is still a huge divide between people who understand what the term is but know how to participate and have the means 
means to participate for those people who don't and you know are still struggling to basically wrap their heads around the concept or have you know the, the economic opportunity to participate so i think for me what's interesting is you know what is the metaverse when we will arrive i think it de it depends on you know a fundamental shift in consumer behavior that is being driven by factors like affordability access to technology um, education um, awareness mm -hmm. um, but also you know i think one other big term would be utility um you know i there's you know among the my social connections i know there's a huge divide between people who are super into crypto web3 maps you know and things like that and people who basically don't really understand or like the concept only because they don't see any utility in it. They don't understand why they need to have an avatar or be in you know, a virtual space. So um, you know, I don't have the answers, but these are the you know, things that I think about and through the conversations that I have with people around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. So you know, we're talking to entrepreneurs and we are ourselves entrepreneurs. So I want to get to the, the business opportunities here too. So. Annie, I'll start with you. Where do you think the business opportunities lie? I mean, we have the traditional sectors like gaming and that will obviously continue, but there are all these new opportunities out there related to, to this metaverse, metaverses uh, developing. So uh, I'd love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually want to tie in a lot of the, the conversation we just had to the, the answer. So mm -hmm. I want to kind of go back to identity interoperability and then also this whole conversation around blockchain versus and Web3 versus the metaverse. Mm -hmm. So first thoughts is I think when it comes to identity, there are a lot of uh, rich opportunities there. And the way that I think about identity is not necessarily an avatar, right? The same way in a real world, if you're traveling to different countries, for example, or if you're moving to different social situations, it's not necessarily how you look or how you come off in that moment in time that defines how you behave or what opportunities you're exposed to. It's probably what your job is, you know, what you know as your knowledge base, who your friends are, like what do you have access to? And so in a similar way, um, I think with the metaverse, that's how we should think about identity is um, a lot of people talk about the digital wallet as kind of being your identity. And that's trying to encompass things like um, not just, you know, like your, I, I don't know, like avatar name or your username, but also what do you own in the virtual world? What are the different worlds that you have access to? What are the communities that you're participating in? And what are the connections that you have? And so sometimes instead of just saying like, hey, my avatar is going to show up in the same way in every metaverse experience, it's actually the summation of what represents you in a digital world and how you can kind of plug that into the different experiences that you find yourself in that matters. Um, so that's kind of one thought around interoperability. Um, so another important part is tying that to economics, right? So if you actually own a lot of things and if you actually have access to capital or access to resources within the virtual world, that's going to change what you're able to do, right? If you have a lot of Robux, for example, on Roblox, and imagine if you ca can cash that out and then you can translate buying things into in a different virtual world, then that's going to give you a different level of access than if you know, you're just new to the metaverse and you don't have anything. Um, so that's one thought. Another thing is um, around our conversation of, you know, what uh, does like the actual metaverse experience feel like? Um, a lot of people talk about these parallel experiences, like, for example, we're going to create a headquarters of an office and directly recreate that into the metaverse, or we're going to try to build Disneyland into the metaverse. I actually don't think that's what people are looking for. I think what's really important, what's going to drive utility and people valuing virtual experiences more than certain physical experiences is if they find inherent value in the metaverse that they can't in the physical world. So I think NFTs are actually a really good example of that where there are things that are only accessible and valued in the virtual world and people invest a lot of time doing that. Even building real estate, for example, on Decentraland, people are trying to buy a lot of sand, they're trying to acquire property. And as a result of how much interaction there is and how much like engagement there is in a space, that puts up the, the real estate value of that place. So the way that I would think about, you know, opportunities of true value when it comes to creating utility and experiences on the metaverse is 
what is an experience that you can actually make that's better than the offline world, right? Can you make education better, right? Can you make it so that kids don't want to go to the classroom and they want to log into whatever it is that you build and they think they're learning more, right? Can you actually make it so that work is more efficient and collaboration is more efficient in the online world than actually going into a huddle and being in a brainstorm session in the physical world? So I think those are the opportunities that I'd urge people to look into. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really interesting, Annie. I love that concept of like we're not just recreating things, right? But how do we actually enhance things as we go? Um, it's yeah, very very interesting. Other comments on that topic? I, I think, oh, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Patrick, You go ahead first. Sure. Ahead. Um, I'm actually very interested to hear your your thoughts on this, Annie, because I've been thinking about this identity um, for a while now, where there hasn't been a lot of talk about the big companies that are trying to really own uh, the open metaverse identity, but you have Facebook, right? Obviously meta uh, where a lot of the apps across your that you run across your daily life, you log in through your, your Facebook identity, um, the Apple ID, uh, Microsoft's Xbox ID. And so I think there's sort of a war brewing for who gets to own the, uh, the identity in the metaverse, who gets to own your ID. And, uh, you know, you look at the Microsoft acquisition of Activision, for example, right? It's, it's, kind of, it's, a known, it's a known secret that gaming is what's going to lead into the metaverse, right? And that's what's really driving this forward in a lot of fronts. Um, and, you know, there's reason to think that that's possibly a, a way to capture a lot of um, the Activision users and that entire gaming user base as a means to get them onto the Xbox ID, right? Mm -hmm. And so I haven't heard a lot from the Apple, but certainly Facebook and Microsoft are up there. Um, and this, there's a huge opportunity and I think a, a huge, um, like I said, war brewing that, you know, there's going to try to be a single or, or a couple, um, you know, people that are companies that are trying to own this space. Well, that's so interesting I mean, Pat, because I think, you know, we should, if, if we're buying into web three, we're going to own our own ID and our own. Well, I think this is a really interesting. Monetize it, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is a really interesting topic of discussion because all, all industries, all sectors go through cycles of expansion and consolidation. I mean, that's look back in the history of economics. That's what you got. So it, it becomes something that is a little bit different. I, 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 I kind of see it in two parallel phases you know one as with everything it's what drives the participation what drives the creation of a community which in, ultimately at the end of the day is some form of content now whether that means something like games tvs or movies or whether it's something broader expanding the definition of content to include things like what is an educational program or what can that cover some of the topics that Annie brought in at the end of the day people are going to want to be doing something in this space, whether that's whatever type of virtual space or physical space that ends up being or interacting. So I think that's driving some of the high valuations we're seeing for content companies in the market right now. We're seeing these massive bubbles that some of them make logical sense and some of them you're just like, why are you dropping $500 million into this? Like yeah. there's no, like yeah. nobody in the right mind. Really? That. And you yeah. see this bubbling kind of up in the content world because the recognition that it's hard to make content yeah. And it's hard to make things that drive people there is, is, is a real one that's coming forward. But I think that is part and parcel to this larger conflict that Patrick's sort of highlighted here, which is this consolidation that we're now starting to recognize has already happened because the decisions of, that are, we see playing out in the market of VCs you know, executing on the acquisitions of what they bought and larger companies consolidating, those decisions were made two years ago. Right, and start in that process. And now we see them hit the market and talk. So what we're really seeing is, is the consolidation of what was already kind of decided who's going to make that play. Mm -hmm. And the real and, and that ultimately boils down to a tech stack. Mm -hmm. And right now, the means by which we all connect to each other is a tech stack that is server farm driven mm -hmm. in one way or another. In the in cryptocurrency markets for a long time with proof of work standards, that was driven by who could own the most processors. Now that's shifted to a more economic base. We're yet to see kind of who's going to win that battle or the way that goes. We're still fighting on it. But in the end, who owns the server farms? Well, ultimately, that boils back to a few groups of people. Mm. If the ideals of Web3, as they are espoused, which mm. form part of the metaverse and this idea we could break, they are going to be met, is there a way to break away from consolidated backbone mm. server farms? And that's a big question right now. There are groups that are doing that. 
we, we all know about file token and some of these ones I'm I'm advising a, a group right now that's that's looking at that called crust which is going mm -hmm. going international and trying to do that but the question is can that really be an effective means right we all know Silicon Valley the TV show in that famous time when when Guilfoyle saves the company by 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 changing the internet to put all of their data stored throughout a mesh network of of, of fridges right <laughs> across the world you know, you know these these systems do exist also can they replace are they fast enough big enough strong enough robust enough to replace the mm. speed of the internet that we built and run this infrastructure is a big question right now and if they are will they end up being consolidated as well right if you're going to take that gamble are you just going to get bought out so I, I think there's the infrastructure question yeah. about whether those ideals we talk about web3 is supposed to achieve can really be achieved or if it just becomes a component of a new iteration of web2 is a huge debate going on right now yeah. and i think on top of that what drives you know you talk about business opportunities in the metaverse well if you're not in the core tech trying to fight that battle the next bet is why are people going to come and who's going to make a better game in the end right i, I won't bring up roblox because annie you're there and i don't want to get into discussions about you know what you guys might be doing or not let's take the central <laughs> land who's going to be you know who's going to build the better fun experience to go spend your sand in Decentraland? is it going to be a game dev or is it going to be a, a hollywood guy who learns the tech we we don't really know because right now we only have a couple of platforms that are really into this but as that expands and changes how, yeah. how are storytellers really going to get involved i think there's a <laughs> huge business opportunity in that I want to I want to bring Ellen into the conversation because so so much of this in my mind anyway relates back to yeah. you know the decentralization issues, cryptocurrencies, blockchain. Those were I think uh, very promising in terms of how we address some of this the issue of central control of some of this backbone. But so far it's not more efficient as we know, <laughs> perhaps less efficient. So Ellen, your your comments on that. Yeah, I think, you know, I can just talk to what I've seen in terms of some of the projects that we ran within the Digital Currency Innovation Lab um, itself, you know, uh, I think in terms of business opportunities, there are a lot of businesses that still don't understand, I would say traditional businesses, they don't understand what the metaverse is and what opportunities, you know, they have by going into the metaverse. So I think, you know, um, a lot of them have reached out in terms of, you know, asking for consultative services, which you know, we try to pair them with, you know, other companies that can help bring them into Web3 or help them, you know, develop uh, their presence within the metaverse. Um, you know, so those are traditional businesses uh, they were seen from, you know, simple things like how do I accept crypto as part of my e-commerce, um, you know, store operations to I'm an artist and I want to create an NFT. Like, where do I start? Uh, I'm a nonprofit and I'm trying to raise, you know, uh, funds, um, crypto, right, for, for fundraising. How do I approach this? Uh, what are some of the tax and compliance issues that I have to deal with? So I think there's a lot of, you know, business opportunities. If we're talking about it in terms of, you know, um, adjacent to the metaverse, helping all these, you know, companies that might be left behind or entities that might let be left behind into this new world. Um, and of course, you know, uh, I think, other, what, what we've been seeing and a lot of conversations that we've been having as well at, you know, would be uh, branding and advertising, you know, within the metaverse itself that, you know, for instance, you know, if we have um, one of the large uh, manufacturers here in Hawaii, they want to go to the metaverse, but they're saying, I don't want to build out everything myself. You know, is there a way where we can partner with someone who helps us to brand and position ourselves in Decentraland, for example? Um, you know, so how do we go about that? So I think, um, you know, beyond just the world of gaming, which, you know, I'm not, you know, super into, I know that, you know, there are all these ancillary services that traditional businesses need um, to help them navigate this space. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I just want to yeah. add on top of what Ellen just mentioned, because it's 100% correct. I mean, there's going to be different iterations where other industries can enter into this space and to get a core understanding of cryptocurrency, uh, 3D development, of uh, art skills and all these things, if you ask where people might think of not just from a business perspective, but also from a career or a training perspective, you know, I'm always someone who wants to try to bring these back to the island. So for, for, you know, for young people who might be listening to us that are based in Hawaii or based in the Pacific and trying to think about this, the metaverse can be your gateway if you can learn the basic skill sets to interact with this, which grew out in a lot of times of the video game industry and that and now have taken on other things but mm -hmm. it's incredibly important that we also 
work with you know governments on the islands and nonprofits and areas to try to welcome these skill sets to start being developed locally because story people who want to create these stories who want to create these opportunities to bring in local companies that doesn't just have to come from off the islands there we actually could get entrepreneurs on the islands building this if we can get the skill sets locally there and that the talent is there so it's mm -hmm. kind of a connection point and I, th I think i think there's there's opportunities for that in hawaii right now too of course to, i always agree with you there devin yeah and then back to uh you know, i think annie's point about value for and this may be more web three but blockchain games if you look at like axie infinity um you know there were two and a half million million daily average users in the philippines and that really helped support their economy and, and a lot of the the the, the philippine uh, people that were out of work during covid and and you know they jumped on because they were able to earn money while playing axie infinity and so yeah. there's going to be a, a massive opportunity, I think, for play to earn in this space with um, new blockchain games that come up, new ways to earn money, especially, you know, ones that are more replicative, replicative of, of esports and, and, and the, you know, traditional FPS games and things that you see on the esports scene. The more of that that starts to pop up, the more, you know, this will start to become, um, you know, a, a real ph phenomenon. So. Um, we've we've seen it to a degree with some of these blockchain games, but there's a lot more opportunity and a lot more space for for companies to grow there. Yeah, we haven't. Yeah, we didn't even talk about this the, the play to earn space, which is kind it's of fascinating. It, yeah. It's fascinating, right? It, <laughs> we could go on and on about just that alone. Um, all right, but I want to get our audience uh, in here uh, to ask some questions. So if you have a question, you can put it in the Q and A function or raise your hand if you're brave enough to come on screen and ask it. Um, I see somebody put a question in the chat, which is about metaverse and the healthcare space. Does anybody have a comment on the metaverse and healthcare? A little bit on our side, we actually have started to breach into that uh, a, a little bit. It's, you know, the, the challenge is what aspect of healthcare? Healthcare is huge. And there's so many different ways that can interact. If you're talking about Web3 in healthcare, there's solutions to go into. If you're talking about using immersive technologies to facilitate training or facilitate collaboration, there's a lot going on. I think in healthcare, we have one unique aspect of the industry that's different than other industries we talk about is the immediacy of someone's life on the line in many scenarios with healthcare. And I think there's always a lot of caution before we see too big of an adoption of a new technology that, that it has been proved out. And, and even these solutions in different parts of the healthcare sector that we do see coming in, they're, 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 they're very, very careful in proving out kind of what's there before that, that ever gets adopted clinically, for example. So there's, there is a lot of space. I'd be happy to jump in and really talk about it, but I don't want to dominate the whole discussion here, but there are elements of what we've talked about today that are popping into healthcare all over. Anyone else seen a, a healthcare kind of application in the metaverse that's interesting? Yeah, I can ch chime in here. I definitely think that probably from the educational and the training aspects, that's going to be a really powerful one, right? There's no better way to learn about how to be a practitioner or, um, you know, some of the specifics other than a very applied immersive environment. So I know that there are a lot of developments in that realm. And this is actually a realm where VR is really, really good, right? Like it, the level of fidelity that VR is able to provide, especially for something that's very highly specific or detailed, um, really important. Uh, the other thing is actually, I've heard a lot about like exposure therapy. And so this is more getting into mental health or psychiatric practices and stuff. But um, the metaverse is an opportunity for you to have exposure and replay scenarios and experiences and kind of retrain your mind and retrain your behaviors. So um, I've definitely heard of different startups doing that. And I, I think that's a really good avenue to explore. If anyone is very curious about that, the, uh, the, one, of the, one of the VR laboratories that you USC is, uh, is founded and operated by a man named Skip Rizzo, who's done a lot of early study into the use of VR as part of experiential treatment for PTSD for mm. returning soldiers. And they have a wealth of publicly available documents and, and research reports that are just, and you can search at USC, uh, the PTSD VR, you'll be able to find it pretty easily, but it's, it's quite effective. 
it's there, there's a lot out there now. I think if you guys Google it, you'll be able to find it. Yeah, cool. VR I, I definitely think there's a lot of applications, like Annie said, yeah. about you know the training aspect, especially when you think of you know where is immersion most useful. And you can think of certainly uh, ER uh, in ER is definitely a high stress environment that you might want to replicate before you you throw a doctor or a nurse into that environment, uh, potentially in an immersive virtual world. I know in the military, we did this uh, when I was down at Fort Benning, I was a tank officer in the army. Um, there is a whole simulation center down at Fort Benning in Georgia, and it is a massive building that has uh, little mini modules of tanks. So you step into the turret, you get into uh, a virtual world, essentially, it's sort of a mixed reality, because you have, uh, you know, a dedicated world, but everything you see through screens, everything that you would normally see, sort of puts you into an environment um, that allows you to experience a high stress situation, be immersed in, uh, you know, for the military, obviously, it was a war situation. Um, but it's incredibly important for high stress jobs to, to have that training before you're thrust into a scenario where you don't know how you're going to react. You don't know how your, your mental state, your emotions are going to, um, you know, be affected by that situation. So it's a really good training tool for, for healthcare, for healthcare workers, emergency medical workers, military, police, fire. And I think you'll see a lot, a lot more applications of certainly VR. Um, they, in, they've kind of, in, they kind of started world. gravitating away from VR in a lot of the mm -hmm. high stress testing and what they've gone into now is a lot of um, a lot of hyper realistic uh, projection systems now what, what, what we've seen happen because of issues what we joked about just before of the clunkiness of the vr headset uh, the headsets i can't yeah. i can't i can't do it yeah. well for example in surgical <laughs> the quest 2 is pretty training, good quest it, is pretty it makes good. me it makes quest i'm starting to get nauseous I get nauseous real easy. So those, those, I'm always like, Oh, after yeah. like in, in, in surgery, for example, one of the challenges we've had um, consulting with, with physician advisors and developing modules for this is when you have a, a, a headset that encloses your view, you're relying on a type of pass through camera system. And that actually violates a ton of medical principles and what you need to do. So, yeah. so, so there, there, you have to, depending on whether you're actually practicing surgery or whether it's a training module, those are two very different things. And when they try to bring this into surgical settings, you, 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 you have to have a, a freedom to be able for the doctor to move and actually look at what's happening for it to be adopted. So there's, I know they've been working on this on for a long time. There was yeah. even a Hawaii startup that was doing, um, you know, uh, surgical training uh, for in the 3D rendering. I don't, I don't know what actually happened to that startup. I think they probably were a little too early on this, but I mean, I know that we'll get there from here, but it's, uh, as, you, as you, as somebody mentioned in the beginning, um, yeah. the medical industry is particularly slow to adopt new things. Yeah. So we'll probably be last in the line of, of folks that are adopting this. Um, so again, if you have a question for our panel, put it in the Q&A or raise your hand. Oh, this is a long question. Uh, <laughs> educational content, uh, virtual field trips. Yeah, has anybody heard of this approach? One of our one of our partners uh, actually was behind the JPL Mars field trip. If you guys ever read about that, we I uh, didn't. they actually uh, they actually put together a um, an experience where they they got a bus full of school children. They blacked out the windows. And they, and, and they used a projection system and they drove them around Los Angeles outside of the JPL lot and they projected real time images of Mars and made it look wow. like the kids were driving on Mars and taught them about Mars geography and things as they went through. It was Sounds amazing kind project. of scary. <laughs> Sounds it was, scary. It was well, pretty well, cool. Yeah. Who else is uh, experienced with the education space here in, in the metaverse? Annie, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so what a lot of people don't know is um, Roblox actually started off in a very educational lens, and I think it still continues to. So Dave, who's the CEO, actually got the inspiration from his daughter when I think it was like they're at a science fair and she had to do things out of cardboard and with physical things. And he was like, why does she have to build her science fair project like in, in physically, if there's so much technology that can enable that virtually. And so that's where he started to kind of create this physics engine of what are, how can you mimic real world physics as well as possible in the virtual world and enable a far more sophisticated and complex playground with more variables for people to play around with. 
So at the end of the day, even now, um, Roblox is essentially an online physics engine. Like, you know, fire is supposed to behave the same way as it does in real life. Its interaction with maybe wood should be the same way as in real life. And so in many ways, like uh, a platform like Roblox, even though it's seen as a gaming platform, is very much an educational one because it's an ed a playground for anyone to figure out what they want to do and the interactions and stuff like that. Um, so I think from an educational perspective, uh, like I see a lot of that getting pushed to where um, there's a lot of platforms where instead of like trying to have prescriptive educational content, it actually tries to build creation tools for kids or people of the like learning demographic to recreate content that they think is meaningful for other people, whether it's immersive, whether it's gameplay, whether it's, you know, like uh, some like a world building idea, or if it's just kind of more straightforward and it's kind of like a tutorial based thing. So um, within education, I think there's a lot of room for changing like the fundamental building blocks and the fundamental tools that people can use, even educators can use to come up with their curriculum or their educational methods, um, and then kind of shifting how learning is done in the future. Yeah, I think collaboration is a good point to put on top of that. Roblox is a great platform for it. We're looking at a film school education platform right now that we've put around, and this idea of not so much the graphical interface of the metaverse, but the back end you know, sort of collaboration component to what a metaverse allows you to do. Imagine a situation where if I'm sitting in Hawaii and I have a film school partner who's also taking an online film school class sitting in London, and I want to make it like I'm filming a scene where I'm in an office building in London, I go have him go shoot some B-roll outside of his window, and then he's able to upload it to the platform. And then I'm able to come in and interstitch that with some office, internal office shots, maybe at the blue office of, of, of people talking, and we can cut that together and release that as a project, maybe even NFT it as, just, as some type of a, um, as some type of a collaboration that really in an educational framework probably would have been much more difficult 10 years ago to achieve these this type of platform enablement is something really, really exciting that I think we, we talk about metaverse, we get sucked into the sort of gamified aspect of it a lot and it's super exciting and fun, but there is the other back end side to it too that can enable that type of work, which I think is pretty exciting. Yeah, okay. Um, Ellen, how about this question for you? I'd love to hear opinions on NFT use cases that don't involve art trading stuff. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, most of the projects that I've done are with artists. So, you know, yeah. the focus is really about art and, you know, using art as a means for fundraising and so on. But that being said, uh, I have talked to, you know, different nonprofits that are looking into the NFT space uh, with regards to, you know, um, I mean, of course, the, the digital contracts uh, in regards to fundraising as, as well as, you know, building up, uh, I would say, like a you know, funders base uh, by giving them exclusive access to, you know, what the nonprofits can, mm -hmm. can offer from, you know, um, voting on the board uh, to some of the initiatives that they're rolling out uh, in terms of engagement, for example, like beach cleanup projects and things and special, like, you know, uh, events that, you know, the nonprofits would invite these people to. So I think, you know, beyond the whole idea of art, I think there's this whole idea of access and exclusiv exclusivity that's tied to NFTs that, um, you know, not necessarily has to be for an artist, but could be for different organizations from nonprofits to even large corporations, if that makes sense. And I think um, carbon emissions is another one. I don't really, I, I've heard of it. I don't really know the details on that, but I think that's something that some organizations uh, and nonprofits here in Hawaii are really interested in, um, basically using smart contracts as a way to track uh, carbon emissions um, and, you know, whatever activities you do um, to reduce carbon emissions, and then they offer incentives on that and so on. So, happy, yeah. you know, happy to give you more information if I can find that out, uh, if you want to know more, but that's another use case that I've heard uh, for NFTs uh, or for tokens spe specifically beyond um, art. Another kind of related question here is about the use case for buying digital real estate. So um, I'd love to have you guys chime in on this, this issue of digital real estate. Is it just for, you know, the speculators out there? What's the, what's the use case for businesses? You know, should we all be buying virtual real estate? 
Um, who has a, a, an opinion about that? I mean, I, I don't own any virtual real estate, but yeah. uh, I, I do think there is utility in speculation itself. You know, if you look at um, just Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency, they're, the market fluctuates and the market tells you how much uh, value is inherent to your, to your coin. And, and it's no different for uh, digital real estate. So even though there may not be a, a particular um, value that you see, just the fact that it is increasing in value is, I think, worth looking at and, and investigating. Is it, or does that make it a Ponzi scheme, Pat? I mean, we have to ask the question. I'm gonna, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> well, be very careful. There's, here. there's one, there's one use case that I think is really interesting, right? There's, the, I think I saw something in the news that somebody bought uh, the the house next to Snoop Dogg, right? In, right. Uh, well, I have a friend, and who like that's still cool. Like house. that's not a Ponzi scheme. I'd love yeah, to be yeah, in a virtual world next to yeah, Snoop Dogg. I have a friend who keeps you know. trying to sell me a house in his neighborhood. I'm like, I, I got, <laughs> yeah. this is. Yeah. I think it's a mix. I think it's a mix. Buy the house. I'll, 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 I'll interject here. I'm going to be very careful in the way that I phrase this because I don't think this is the only, I don't think this is the end of the way that we're going to see digital real estate be qualified and quantified. I, I think, I think whenever you have a new market, you, you get an explosion of new kind of ideas and stuff gets trendy and things happen. If you ever want interesting reading, go on to some of these, um, investigative or sort of detailed websites that that do uh, transaction tracing and wallet tracing and look at some of these larger real estate investments in NFT sales. There's a lot of data out there that shows it's a, a trades originating from a very small group of people and ending up back in the hands of a very small group of people, perhaps yeah. at inflated prices. Yeah. This stuff is, you know, it's, it's, you know, blockchain is not exactly untraceable. It, it may be, you may not have your identity disclosed because of wallets and, you know, identities and things, but it, it's, there's a lot of evidence out there in the way that this stuff works. That does not mean that foundationally things don't work and that there's not lots of exciting things mm -hmm. there. I think moves like Snoop Dogg to come and try to get in the space are very smart because this is a space that will be around for a while but the speculative nature of some of what's going on out there is can't be denied either and i and i think um you know you got to be you, you gotta you have to take the time to educate yourself on a little bit of technical fluency of how people are doing this if you're planning on actually thinking of it as a financial investment yeah annie what do you what do you think about virtual real estate and where it's headed now yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is, of course, a Ponzi scheme. Anything that is new is going to have also a lot of, you know, sketchy use cases. But what I do think is valuable, and this is where I hope things progress, is if we look at it less like physically, like real estate, like sand, a decentral land, or like physical pieces of real estate in the virtual world, um, things like DAOs, for example, are also kind of properties within the virtual world. And what we see is there's now tokens that are attached to certain organizations or networks, and it its value fluctuates based on perceived value or actual value. Right now, it's still very speculative, but um, what again, going back to like is inherently valuable to people and what sometimes you can't tap into in the physical world that you can in the virtual world is access to networks, right? Of course, like, you know, something like getting a house beside Snoop Dogg in Decentraland seems silly, but you do kind of get access to Snoop Dogg. And in a more practical way, like there's a bunch of DAOs that I'm still waiting to get, you know, like access to. And I keep on hearing like, hey, they're doing this thing here, or there's access to these job opportunities that you can only get if like you are part of this DAO or these investment opportunities that you can only be tapped into if you're a part of this collection. So I feel like that's where there is some sort of value is probably more of the social value and what like access networks and opportunities you can tap into. And tokens are a really good measure of how people perceive that. Mm -hmm. It's all about the FOMO. You got to create that and then monetize it. All right. Last chance audience to ask a question. We're going to wrap up pretty soon. So if you have a question, put in the Q&A or raise your hand. All right, so I will ask the last question. Um, so what does the future look like here? We've talked about what it is, what will it be? And how can we avoid, I guess, this 
dystopian vision that I, my mind goes to instantly. Um, I'm afraid maybe it's my, my age. Um, Pat, I'll start with you. What, what do we, what are we looking at here in the future? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with how do you avoid the uh, dystopian vision? And this yeah. goes back to my comment about the likely war that's going to rage over identification. Um, you know, depending on the company that wins that war, whether you are the customer of that company, like a Microsoft, or you are the product of that company, like a Facebook, uh, will I think determine a lot about what you see and what that experience is like, uh, whether they're using your data to sell different products that they own or selling that to third parties, I think is gonna be an important um, part of that. So um, it's hopefully something that is not behind closed doors and, and the people who are helping to co-build the, the metaverse uh, and co-create it, the, the you know, um, are part of that conversation and able to manage their own data and manage their own identity. Uh, but that'll be, you know, something that's, I think, important to making sure it is not a dystopian uh, mm -hmm. ads in your face and, you know, uh, all of that that you see in, in, um, in, in, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the movie now, but ready, ready player one, ready player one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> my, um, my metaverse example. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, for, for us, we see, I, I personally, you know, come from the gaming background and, um, we see it, it becoming a much more immersive, uh, world with gaming and, and more play to earn opportunities, more immersive games and VR. I'm, I'm personally excited about our first VR leagues that we're able to launch. I think that's going to be really cool. Uh, when we have actual leagues with more esports style games, you're starting to see a couple of these now um, that are not, you know, the uh, Beat Saber or things like that, but more uh, Player One is is a new one. It's a, a kind of a MOBA style game. So more of those I'm very excited about. And, and uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, I, I'm very excited about that potential future. So. All right. Uh, Ellen, what do you see? Future. I'm going to take a more dystopian <laughs> approach to this, unfortunately, just putting on my state government hat on um, and just based on what I've been seeing over the last two years working on the program that we're working on. It's, uh, you know, I think there is a potential for greater digital divide, actually, um, you know, with this whole idea of the metaverse, because it's not something that, you know, people just pick up, I guess, you know, um, naturally. I feel that there's still a lot of people, especially I would say, the older, you know, generations that, you know, would probably need to learn a lot in order to benefit and participate in this, you know, uh, you know, the idea of the metaverse and so on. Uh, but even then, you know, with participation, what does that really mean? Like, do you have the, you know, are you equipped the proper knowledge to participate effectively so that you benefit from it? Or is it more on, you know, like speculation and just following the crowd and you know, just going with the flow and then not really understanding what you're doing, uh, mm -hmm. which is what I'm seeing a lot right now with, you know, just, uh, you know, the average, you know, Joe on the street, right? Um, you know, we have a lot of emails that come in each day that tell us like, I, I lost access to my crypto account. I have no idea what, what they did with my money and things like that. So, you know, I think there's um, a lot of education that, that's uh, required uh, but another thing is also in order to participate in the metaverse, you need infrastructure, right? And Hawaii has an infrastructure problem. Not everybody in Hawaii gets access to the internet, for example, or even broadband. So, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, the whole world, well, it's probably, it's probably a, a problem that the world has, you know, in different areas and different parts of the world. So I think depending on how infrastructure develops as well, I think, you know, there's a potential for a divide that comes with, you know, this whole idea of going to web three in the metaverse, but to see what happens i guess oh. all right annie your your future vision here yeah like? i i mean i want to echo points which mm -hmm. is that like there are a lot of potential dangers with technology there's always good and bad and so i would say for the most part it's going to evolve in the same way the same way like this current version of the internet has its good and bads it's going to continue with the metaverse um, what I think what I've found is most effective as like ways to prevent bad outcomes is really just allowing people to have self-awareness and education and kind of guardrails to understand 
like the choices that they're making, right? So an example is a lot of the misinformation uh, dialogue. For a while, people thought what they were reading were truth or was balanced and it was a good representation of the world. And I think when there was more of awakening that, hey, you know, it might not be misinformation, but this is a echo chamber of information that doesn't represent the full truth, then people started to seek out more other kinds of information. Um, another is like mental health, right? I think there was severe mental health issues with social media, especially with Gen Z. And for a while, that wasn't part of the dialogue. And people just thought they had to put attention seeking content in to socially belong. And when there was an awakening of like, hey, you don't have to do this, like, this is not positive for you, um, people started to change their behaviors. So I think a big one maybe for the metaverse is I really hope that people are not 24 seven online all the time. And so if there can be caps of like, hey, you know, like go touch grass or like go outside into the world and immerse yourself or like learn how to fiz fix something like your toilet or some plumbing issue or whatever it is that might be helpful. Um, and then also just uh, trying to steer people into problem solving for the real world while they are in the metaverse, right? Like things like climate change issues or political issues. I think a lot of that can actually be educated and um, sorted out through virtual collaboration. So if people can uh, pivot their attentions to more positive um, things to work on, um, the metaverse might actually be a positive place for that. Yeah, I'm, I, I love that idea because I'm, I'm always thinking, gosh, we have put a lot of brain power and thinking and time into some pretty trivial pursuits in the metaverse so far. <laughs> So I'd love to see it shift towards a little bit more, you know, solving of real world problems, you know, and that kind of uh, flavor. But uh, Devin, your future vision. I'm going to run counter to everybody here. Guys, relax. Go beach. I didn't realize the COVID depression had hit so hard for everyone. I mean, come <laughs> on. Maybe it's just a boon time for the entertainment industry, but we're actually doing pretty good. This is, you know, we're, we're all coming out of this. The metaverse is just one more place where we get to play with new ideas. In the end of the day, that's what it is. You know, you only lose as much as you invest into something. So if you're not sure, don't invest into it. And, but you could still play with it. I think it's one of the most exciting times that's ever existed for, for storytellers. Never before has it been this easy to create an idea that you love, that you want to live with in your head, and to be able to share it with people in different formats that you're comfortable with. You could choose to write your stories on your social media. You could choose to tell it in, in a metaverse platform if you want to, with tools that help you do that. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, in the past, I grew up in a Hollywood family and 70s and 80s, nepotism was the word of Hollywood. It didn't matter that you spent all your money in film school. Barely anybody ever got a chance to get into the industry or actually make their chance. That's that's so far from the case now compared to what it used to be. Rejoice. Get out there and write your stories. Be creative. Like, try. Get, you know, people are receptive to it. And the metaverse is one new giant opportunity to find ways of putting that story out. And, oh, you know, protect yourself. Sure. Just like we would anywhere. And do things in a way where you're smart, but it's, it's you know, the whole world's not going to collapse into the stacks of Ready Player One anytime soon. I, I, I think, I think we, it's very easy for us to fall that way when we- I hope not, I hope not. For two years. So <laughs> we're in a good place right now. It's exciting. This is the branch right. of a whole new area people can get into. Well, there you go. We're going to have to wrap it up there. We're over time. Thank you to everyone for uh, attending today and listening to the conversation and then participating in the conversation. Um, to remind you again, Blue Startups is recruiting for cohort 14 that will run this summer. Our application is on our website, bluestartups.com. If you're interested in joining the next cohort, uh, we are always looking for new businesses in many different sectors, including the metaverse. So please do apply with that. I wanna thank our panel, Ellen, Pat, Evan, and Annie. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. We super appreciate it. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Aloha. Mahalo, everybody. Thanks.